sure that you're so secure. It's unbelievable. We have really checked into this potential criminal and everything is okay. Are we on? Okay. I hope you didn't you didn't dis disseminate everything else up till now anyway. So I am very happy to welcome you to this, um, I think it's the second uh, CDC's Prevention Science Series, uh, supported by the American Social Health Association. I am very proud today to present to you Dr. Robert Brunham, who is um, an emeritus professor in medicine at the University of British Columbia and head of the Vaccine Research Laboratory at the British Columbia Center for Disease Control in Vancouver. He is very famous for chlamydia studies. I'm sure you all know it. He is very broad in his approach because he deals with epidemiology, immunology, as well as um, genomic approaches in all of his research. He has taught many, many, many people in the field, and he has contributed immensely. Those of you who have been around for a little bit know Bob, and those of you who are really new are going to know Bob. Uh, I have personally learned a huge amount from him, and without more to do, I think I'm gonna turn it over to Bob. And Bob has been so generous. He's gonna do this lecture for us. He's gonna do a fascinating lecture, the paper for which you have all read for us at one o'clock. And then he's gonna spend some time with us to have a panel discussion. So we're really grateful for your generosity as well, Bob. Thank you. Thank you for that. Extraordinarily warm welcome, and uh, uh, actually a, a wonderful hospitality about being back in Atlanta again. It's a true pri privilege to be here, and uh, always feel like I've come back home in some metaphorical way. I am a legitimate visitor. I just <laughs> this was this was a difficult thing for me to get. So you, perhaps you don't quite appreciate that. Um, so as Sefki says, I'm an infectious disease physician scientist who's been interested in the population biology of infectious disease. So I'm not so much interested, although I did work as a clinician in the practice of individual infectious disease, but actually understanding the phenomenon of infectious disease transmission at the whole population level. And because of that, I've really combined the approaches of epidemiology with immunology, uh, with genomics. And through that experience with genomics, I've come to appreciate the profound and transformative impact that genomics is having on all of medicine, including public health. And it's that story I want to tell you about today. I should cut to the chase by saying, genomics has really given us now an evidence base to transform our theoretical framework of medicine for one, from one based on mechanisms of disease to another based on evolution, evolutionary medicine. And so I want to demonstrate some of those genomic insights that allow us now to frame medicine and public health in an evolutionary medicine perspective. All right? This has transformative impacts on how we describe the domains of public health in clinical medicine, on how uh, we teach medicine to medical students or even at the bedside, how we practice medicine and integrate new genomic insights into that practice, and how we can define new research uh, perspectives in ways that wouldn't have been contemplated with a mechanism only approach. So the sources for my talk uh, are hundreds of papers, obviously, but th uh, these two textbooks, which uh, probably not many of you have read, I can highly recommend. The first is The Logic of Chance by Eugene Koonin, who works at the NIH as a bioinformatician. And he talks about the evolution of genomes. And that's what makes this such a special book. Because instead of using a gene-centric point of view, to describing evolution, he uses a genome perspective. And after I read this, I felt it was like the Principia Biologica. 
It, it was really the overview of all of medicine or all of evolution and biology. And I really loved his insights. And the second is a more down to earth text by uh, two individuals from Yale, uh, Stephen Stern, who's an evolutionary biologist and Ruslan Metsatov, who's an immunologist entitled Evolutionary Medicine. And some of the examples I'll give in my talk are drawn from this textbook. So uh, this uh, evolutionary medicine perspective really joins the other two great organizing principles in medicine, which have come about over 2,400 years of med medical history. The first was Hippocrates notion that health is really due to an equilibrium state of within the individual and the individual with their environment. Uh, within the individual, uh, he actually believed that disease occurred at the whole organism level, at the whole body level, and was due to an equilibrium. His mechanism was completely wrong, but an equilibrium of four humors that circulated throughout the system. But it was, he was a holistic physician. And that held sway for nearly uh, 2,000 years until the Renaissance anatomists began to finally dissect the body. And they found out if you had a headache, the disease was in the brain. If you had a cough, the pathology was in the chest. If you have abdominal pain, the disease was in the belly. This was the first step towards the reduction process in medicine, which has gone on uh, for the next five centuries in terms of understanding disease and health. The final uh, explanatory principle is one based on the notion of information that biological entities are essentially encoded on molecules at the executive level, uh, those molecules are primarily the nucleic acids, which contain all the instructions necessary to assemble a cell and a whole organism. But importantly, that specific organization of information is specific to the history of that organism. So you can trace the history of an organism by understanding the sequence of its DNA. So not only can you predict how the cell is going to be put together and the organism is going to be put together from the DNA sequence, you can, you can also determine its history. Uh, so as I said at the outset, genomics provides an evidence base for evolutionary medicine. And remarkably, evolutionary biologists and clinicians actually are focused on the same two questions. What is a patient and what is a disease? And evolutionary medicine offers a, a way for us to see how both biologists and clinicians can come to a common answer on those two questions. So what is a patient? Well, the first thing to understand about the origin of the human genome is to understand the origin of humans. And this began with a process, presumably with our Australopithecine ancestors, about 2.5 million years ago, where two of the primate chromosomes, 12 and 13, fused to form human chromosome two. So we have two fewer chromosomes than do our closest genetic relatives. But that's important because it allowed the new genus Homo to be reproductively isolated from its closest relatives, Australopithecines. In other words, it wasn't beginning to borrow genes back from its close contemporary relatives. It was reproductively isolated and that allowed for the evolution of the genus Homo the species sapien had its origins in North Africa about 300,000 years ago. So the most remarkable thing that happened after the reproductive isolation of the genus Homo was this dramatic expansion in the brain. That's the defining characteristic of this genus. There were also changes in the life cycle within the genus Homo that accompanied this expansion of the brain and this was surprising to me. It was the evolution of childhood. Childhood's not found 
in chimpanzees and bonobos. It's only found in human beings. And the other was the extension of life after the cessation of reproduction. And presumably, those two life phases allowed for the onboarding of culture and learned traits that enabled cooperation and survival within the genus Homo. So there are obviously are genetic and genomic determinants for those phenotypes, but that is what came to define Homo sapiens. And so it is kind of curiously interesting to me that childhood is something that is unique to human beings, which, you know, because I've now got grandchildren, I begin to appreciate in its true entirety. The other thing to recognize is that we don't inherit genomes as intact structures because they are broken down at meiosis to form gametes. And over evolutionary time, this shuffling of genomes means that the only thing that evolution acts on are the genes within the genome. So this is very important to understand. What evolves are sequences and genes, not genomes. And this means that the human genome is a mosaic of genes of widely different origins. Some of them are incredibly ancient. About 20% of our genome is shared in an orthologous fashion with genes in all organisms on Earth. This represents our common genetic origin. These are often involved in protein synthesis. About 40% of genes are shared with all eukaryotes, that is higher cellular organized cells. So sometimes I tell my friends, you think you're closely related to a chimpanzee, but did you know that you're 40% related to a banana? I mean, it's a profound <laughs> insight how we all share this common origin. Uh, essentially, all genes in mammals are orthologs of one another. So evolution has proceeded not so much through the process of inventing new genes, but in inventing new pathways of regulating those genes and creating interactions among genes. It only takes 20,000 genes to make a human being, and it takes that many genes to make a fly, which again is a very interesting fact of life. Another thing about the genome is we're composed of about 220 different cell types but every cell has an identical genome. Each cell expresses about 5,000 genes. What makes a cell different from its mate in a different organ is really which of those 5,000 genes are expressed, the pattern of expression of genes, and that's called epigenomes. This is how we regulate the expression of the genome. And that's how we go from a single cell to a multicellular creature, which is us. But the other thing about the epigenome is that the environment can determine the expression as well. And this happens almost exclusively during fetal and childhood life. And one of the most graphic examples of this, I believe, is the ex dramatic expansion in the human lifespan over the 20th century from about, uh, you know, about 25 to perhaps as much as 30 years expansion in the human lifespan has occurred over that decade. Why has that occurred? One of the most interesting insights is, and I'm sorry, I don't have a pointer, so I can't really work with this, but is as we've lowered infant mortality, we've slowed adult mortality. And I wish I could point to this, but... Ah, okay, here we go. Uh, there's a, something that insurance people know about. This is called the Gompertz inflection point. At some point in adult life, you switch from a given expression of your genome to one that's regulated towards an aging process. And when Gompertz, Benjamin Gompertz, who lived in the 1830s and worked for the British Insurance Society, noted this, he noted that he could predict uh, survival patterns in his contemporary age in the 1830s 
uh, by looking at this rate of mortality. And this inflection point in the 19th century was about the age 40. During the 20th century, that inflection point has moved rightward to near age 60 now. And in other words, it is true that 60 is the new 40. <laughs> you can see it in this actuarial data. And this is probably due to the fact when a fetus and a child senses a relatively rich environment, they reset this aging program or delay the onset of that aging program in order to enjoy their fruits of that fruitful environment they find themselves in. So this is a phenomenon really of the developed world, but it's incredibly interesting to see it related to epigenomes. So the epigenome works at this two levels during development and during uh, maturation. What age? Well, maturation occurs postnatally. Development occurs prenatally. I'm talking about uh, development of the body systems, the organs. Maturation involves it. The next great uh, genome attribute is that it is very interesting to know that human Homo sapiens evolved in North Africa. And only a few hundred left North Africa about uh, 70,000 years ago. These few hundred people represented just a sampling of the genetic diversity uh, that was found in Africa. And even to this very day, even though the most phenotypic differences in the world are found in how people appear as they went into these different parts of the world, much of that genetic difference does not reflect the true genomic diversity, which is maximal in Africa, and all people outside of Africa are more related to each other than they are to Africans. So there was this global migration pattern. It was slow. It occurred over tens of thousands of years. Small numbers of founders populated given regions, and they expanded their population. So you get clustering of genetic types, uh, which would characterize Middle Eastern people, European people, South and Central Asian people, East Asia, Oceania, and the, the Americas. And these people are all, mo all more closely related to one another than we are to Africans, where most of human genetic diversity is found. In fact, if you were looking for the next Einstein, you would look at Africa not in the rest of the world, because most of the genetic diversity is found there. So th this is another attribute of the hu human genome. And when you go to do genome-wide association studies, the easiest thing to find are alleles that correlate with infectious disease. So as people went into their different environments, they encountered new pathogens and new diets. And so most of the allelic variation that was acquired during the human migration patterns relate to drug metabolism pathways and to other phenotypic attributes which cause us to resist infectious diseases. And it's interesting when you look at some of these diseases to begin to realize either how fast uh, a genetic adaptation is a is acquired in the hu human genome, or how ancient some pathogens are. Like leprosy is one for which there is strong genetic association. Or uh, Kutzfeldt-Jakob disease is, a, is another one. Th these tend to indicate that some pathogens are quite ancient in the human environment. Another thing genomes have done for us is they've shown that humans have a second genome that is our microbiome. So we have about 20,000 genes in our genome, but the microbiome has between two and 20 million genes. It's a huge genetic structure, which is symbiotic with us. And it basically, this is uh, perhaps the 11th organ of the body. It uh, was really acquired at the origin of multicellularity. It coats the epithelial surfaces 
and it's imputed advantageous property is that it enabled a large organism to acquire more nutrients from incoming uh, food sources than would be available based on your endogenous metabolism determined among those 20,000 genes. But, you know, once you begin to live with a large number of microbes, you have to manage them. And so the microbiome has had this co-evolution with the evolution of defense systems. These are of two classes, the innate defenses, which basically recognized highly conserved structures on microbes, and the adaptive system, which rep uh, recognizes very specific protein sequences in a microbe. So they uh, kind of recognize different components of a microbe. This system, this defense system, has carried a very large evolutionary benefit at a hidden cost until we began to control infectious diseases. So, in summary, what is a patient? Well, uh, the genome is a genetic mosaic with different evolutionary histories. It undergoes a process of expression, which results in uh, developmental and phenotypic plasticity with the environment predominantly affecting the genome during fetal and child life. That life history, as we see it from a human perspective, is only recently involved. That is that we have children and that we live a long time. Global migration, which occurred recently, has resulted in most of the genomic variability and it underlies infectious disease susceptibility and drug responses. This individualization of drug responses is why some people respond to drugs and others don't. And it's the basis for precision medicine. And lastly, uh, what is a patient? A patient has a microbiome. So medicine is all about disease. I know you in public health think medicine should be all about health, but really as a doctor, it's all about disease. It's incredibly complicated and difficult to learn and it goes on for centuries. There are, according to the ICD-10, there are over 12,000 diseases. Did you know that, 12,000? There are a lot, but it's finite. There are about 6,000 drugs. There are 2,500 surgeries and there are about 1,500 other medical interventions. This is why medicine becomes specialties, because no one doctor can do all of this. It also makes learning, teaching, and practice extremely difficult. Evolutionary medicine, on the other hand, has a concept of disease, which is somewhat simpler. There are, in general categories, two causes of disease. One of them are extrinsic, they're really from the environment, and they're random. Uh, in, I'll talk a little bit about these, but infectious disease is an example of an extrinsic cause. And it's really these e extrinsic forces which have shaped most of the variability that we see in the human genome. And then there are intrinsic causes. Evolution never produces a perfect entity. It's as good as it needs to be. and so the diseases which are intrinsic are due to imperfections in the evolution of the genome. And this re represents really constraints and trade-offs that genes needed to make in order to be with each other in a genome. So extrinsic causes of mortality, infectious diseases, nutrition, injury, temperature, xenobiotics, and many, many others. Uh, in fact, when we first began to think of disease, this is all we thought disease was about, was this category. This is what public health is about. Probably 80% of public health has been about mitigating the impact of extrinsic causes of mortality. Infectious diseases is now one of the areas of medicine which has been in a major way impacted by genomics, and I don't need to tell you at the CDC about that, but I will. Uh, one of the important concepts that evolutionary medicine gave to uh, infectious diseases before the age of genomics was this notion that um, infectious diseases are a battle of genomes, where you have the virulence genes of pathogens interacting with the defense genes of the host. 
and that there was a trade-off between being able to horizontally transmit and having virulence genes. Now, I worked with chlamydia, and so I was astounded to learn that the chlamydia genomes are all basically orthologs of each other. So let's say between the mouse strain of chlamydia, C. mirroderm, I labeled it tier C, trachomatous mouse pneumonitis, and a human strain of C. trachomatis, there are about a thousand genes. All but six genes are found in both genomes. At the protein level, they're only about 80% identical in sequence, so there's been 60 million years of evolution. But actually, the gene content level, pretty, pretty identical. Uh, those gen gene differences are concentrated into one region called the plasticity zone, where the six genes are found, and those genes are all involved in evading the immune mechanisms, either in the mouse cell or in a human cell. So that's interesting observation. Uh, genomics, when you know the genome of a pathogen, in principle, you know all antigens. Of course, not all genes will be antigens, but within that list of genes are the antigens, and of those antigens, some can become vaccines. And so genomics has enabled us now to use a completely rational approach to designing subunit vaccines. And in the case of chlamydia, for which we've done a lot of studies, we found that those antigen genes are found principally as membrane proteins of the organism. And that'll be the basis of this afternoon's lecture. Genomics is what we now do anytime we have a new and, and emerging infectious disease. And uh, SARS is an excellent example of this. Uh, I was in charge of the BC Center for Disease Control at the origin of our SARS. And obviously, there was a large uh, SARS genome program going on here at the time, and both centers came up with a sequence of this new coronavirus. And it was amazing to know that after we got the genome, we could begin to look for where this virus came out of nature and to discover it's really a bat virus and that bats were roosting in the rafters of the wild animal markets in Guangdong and defecating on civet cats, which were being brought in to the cooks in Guang, Guangdong to prepare meals for their hosts, and the cooks became ill. They went to hospital, they infected the doctors in Guangdong. The doctors went to Hong Kong, they infected a hotel floor, and the hotel floor went around the world. And it was so amazing to learn this story thanks to the genome. Another thing that we commonly do with genomes in infectious disease now is that when we have an outbreak, of an infectious disease, like this is a TB outbreak in a small rural community on Vancouver Island in British Columbia. Um, this is the epidemic curve. And at the time this was unfolding, we were the lab where all isolates were sent and we had all of the isolates from this outbreak. And we were scratching our head, why has this large outbreak occurred in this small community? Has there been the acquisition of a new virulence gene in the TB genome, which made it more contagious, or has there been a change in the social circumstances of this community? So we began to look at this in great detail, and we sequenced all 42 TB isolates. And as the TB strain grows in your body, it acquires a small number of new mutations. So you can mark uh, your TB strain goes over to a new person, it begins to replicate again, inquire new, but it has the previous mutation. So you can understand by sequence of the genome, which person gave which TB strain to the next person. When we did this, we found that only three people in this outbreak, this individual, this individual, and this individual uh, are the super spreaders. So three out of 42 individuals spread TB to almost everyone else in this outbreak. So what did they share in common? They were all cocaine smokers. They were extremely popular people. People loved to be around them because they had a sense of humor and they knew how to talk and they smoked crack cocaine in small rooms. 
And so this outbreak, we got RCMP records, and this is the RCMP records of arrests for crack cocaine in this community. These three individuals also had open cavitary TB, which was untreated. They felt, you know, they were young men, they felt he could live forever and their cough meant nothing. But obviously when you smoke crack and you have open pulmonary cavitary TB, you cough a lot <laughs> in a small enclosed room and they spread it to a large number of people. So we were unable, we were able to resolve this story through genomics and this is something that, that can be done, I think, routinely in many disease outbreaks. So, that's infectious disease as an example of extrinsic causes of mortality. I'm moving on to the next category of disease. There are only six of them. This is diseases due to the defense system. Remember I told you, you can have a defense system evolve to deal with a very prevalent uh, issue in your environment, which carries a huge benefit, but also a huge cost. So, uh, when we began to control infectious diseases in the 20th century, it has been truly remarkable to see this rapid rise in autoimmune and allergic diseases. This is uh, really an unmasking of a latent uh, uh, price, and it's called the hygiene hypothesis. The next thing to recognize is when we had that cultural onboarding happening in childhood, given by grandmothers to their grandchildren or grandfathers to their grandchildren. Uh, we had this kind of synergistic cycle of cultural evolution going on. And culture evolves on the scale of decades, perhaps even years now, um, whereas the genome evolves on the scale of centuries, millennia. So there is a mismatch of the rapidity of cultural change with genome adaptation to culture. And so we get a whole class of diseases called mismatch disease. And this is just a pictorial representation of culture among humanity. And culture is what dominates humanity in human communities today. Uh, as I mentioned, culture changes more rapidly than the genome. And um, mismatch diseases are virtually unique to humans, and surprisingly, their pets. We begin to see obesity in dogs now, and cats, and it's amazing how when you change those ecological determinants, uh, you cause uh, disease. So this is a huge category of disease uh, for which public health also plays a role. So some of the most important from public health point of view are the impact of culture on things like diet and activity which has given rise really over the 20th century to the emergence at a high level of diseases such as diabetes, hypertension, atherosclerosis. I was shocked by this statistic. If you compare the average American diet to the diet of hunter-gatherers, Hatsa in Tanzania, sand people in South Africa, what you find is the major difference is in the content of simple sugars which is a, simple sugars for hunter-gatherers, basically honey. Simple sugars for us is anything you go buy in the store now. And simple sugars are now the major component of uh, American diets, perhaps as much as a third. And I'm talking about glucose and fructose and uh, really not the complex carbohydrates in plants, but the simple sugars that are added to, as supplements to most manufactured food. The point is I want to make is that the introduction of these simple sugars into the manufacturing process for foods is probably what is underpinning the obesity epidemic and not the fats that had been previously the focus of much of public health advice. Certainly when you look at this kind of data, you, you can really see that the nutritional differences now are found in simple sugars and not in fats. So here's a wonderful example of how there is this interaction between environmental change, let's say like obesity and fatty liver disease and genes. There is a gene in the liver, which is called, it's a phospholipase. Uh, it's involved in 
triglyceride metabolism in the liver, and there are two variants, an isoleucine and a methionine variant. And uh, shown here on this graph are individuals of different body mass index, BMIs, uh, less than 25 being normal, and increasing BNI, BMIs to uh, greater than 35. And what is found is that if you possess the MM variant of this gene, you have a five-fold increased risk of cirrhosis. So not all obese people develop fatty liver disease, and not all fatty liver disease turns into cirrhosis, but if you have this genetic susceptibility, that's what you get. An odds ratio of five, obviously, is a, a very substantial one and actionable. And it's pro partly based on this kind of data as we go forward and discover more of these variants that we can personalize our messages about public health uh, to individuals at high risk. Human's age, uh, sad to say, this is me in grade six the height of my power at age 24, graduating from medical school, and me preparing this talk. It's humbling to watch yourself. Why do we age? Now, this is a, a big question to evolutionary biologists, and the answering answer is astounding. You know, if you have a lifespan and you have extrinsic causes of mortality, you live long enough, one of those extrinsic causes of mortality is going to act on you. So the risk of extrinsic mortality death typically depends on the length of time you're exposed to that environment. What this does at the whole population level is that it concentrates reproduction in younger ages. And you, evolution is all about reproduction. It's not about health. It's about reproduction. And so you, over evolutionary time, organisms acquire genomes which contain genes which uh, maximize reproduction at young ages. But they may have harmful effects at later ages. Genes are typically like this. They're, they're good for one portion of your life cycle, but not for all portions. This is called antagonistic pleiotropy. And because of antagonistic pleiotropy, we develop things like losing muscle mass, losing uh, nephron units, losing uh, brain circuits, atherosclerosis, diabetes, cancer, and others. So most of these diseases are related to aging, and they have a genetic cause in terms of genes that stop regulating themselves properly over the lifespan. Cancer is a wonderful example of this. Cancer is clearly an age-related disease risk. Our major way of preventing cancer as a genetic solution is this gene called P53. It's a master regulator of the cell that basically ends up programming the cell to kill itself if its DNA is too damaged. So you would think this would be a good thing to have in large amounts. But the more you express P53 the, in an animal, like a mouse, you cause rapid aging in that mouse. So here's an example of a gene that works well up to a certain level. And if you try to overexpress it, it rapidly ages the animal. So there's a constraint on evolving a genetic solution such as that based on P53. What this means is that the goal of medicine is not infinite expansion of the human life. We are all going to age and we are going to die. We are but a tear in the time that we have. So the idea is to promote survival curves to squaring the survival curve and compressing mortality in the narrowest window that we can through public health and medical interventions. This is called the compression of morbidity and mortality. 
described by Dr. Fries in the New England Journal in 1980. This is a classic article. At that time, he thought the maximum achievable lifespan was around 85. We now know from actuarial data that actually the human lifespan is somewhere around 115 years, plus or minus 10. So we still have some ways to go. Many countries have already achieved this 85% uh, notion, but the principle of compressing morbidity and mortality to a narrow window is now the appropriate goal for medicine and public health. Next category of diseases. This is where genomics and genetics initially entered medicine. The, these are the genetic and chromosomal diseases. There are over 4,000 Mendelian diseases now. Uh, actually, because this is an inherent flaw in all DNA-based organisms. There are evolved genetic mechanisms to deal with them. Most fertilizations don't result in a robust embryo. There's things like uh, spontaneous abortion. There's also oocyte uh, atresia. Uh, most fetal females have millions of eggs in their ovaries but over time only a small number, a few thousand are left to ovulate, of which only a few hundred are ovulated over the lifespan. And there's this whole process of, of kind of quality control of the embryo, which uh, results in oocyte atresia for most of them. It's because meiosis, which generates these gametes, is a tricky process and a lot of times mistakes happen then. Also natural selection happens to Mendelian uh, diseased individuals, most often uh, pr prior medicine, prior to the medical era. Uh, but it is interesting, even after uh, we begin to understand Mendelian diseases more generally, we see that new mutations in the same Mende uh, Mende Mendelian disease genes is repeatedly happening in the human genome. Most Mendelian diseases, you require both alleles to be mutated. They're uh, recessive, and so you, the individual has to have both disease genes in order to express the disease. Uh, having a single copy of disease gene for most Mendelian diseases, where it's been carefully looked at, actually has a heterozygote advantage, and sickle cell carriers are a perfect example of this. But cystic fibrosis is thought to defend against some enteric diarrheal disease. And, you know, there are other examples like this of where Mendelian diseases in that carrier form are actually a, a genetic immunity mechanism. And now we have the age of CRISPR. And uh, there are approaches now for individuals who have Mendelian disease genes, the recessive kind, where you can go in and repair the one disease allele and give relief from the disease. They become a carrier, so they're at risk of transmitting, but at least they don't suffer the disease. This was a complete, this is the last category. This is, was a complete new category of disease for me, which is called genomic conflict. It's not commonly appreciated that the fetus is only 50% identical to the mother. And so there can be conflicts between the maternal interest and the fetal interest. And within the fetus, they have chromosomes that have come from the father and chromosomes that have come from the mother. And they can be in conflict about their own self-interest. So at the level of fetal maternal uh, conflict, there are fetal genes which may act selfishly, selfishly to get more blood to the placenta or to get more nutrients to the fetus. This can result in gestational diabetes and in preeclampsia and eclampsia. And as I mentioned, the maternal and paternal chromosomes may also be in conflict via genomic imprinting. And I'm gonna show you an experiment of nature which makes this point, which is illustrating that major neuropsychiatric diseases may be due to genomic conflict. I say this is maybe because it's uh, really under investigation, but this genetic experiment uh, really suggests that this is the case. So what we have here is uh, two syndromes called the Engelmann syndrome and prader willi syndrome. They both involve nearly identical deletions in chromosome 15, the long arm between band 11 and 13. In Engelmann's 
uh, syndrome, the deletion occurred on the mother's chromosome, the maternal chromosome. So you have preferential expression of paternal genes. In prouder willi the deletion occurred on the uh, father's chromosome, and you have overexpression of maternal genes. So prouder willi uh, where you uh, have this uh, overexpression of maternal genes, so the maternal interest might be to limit uh, how, how much she's giving to her fetus, you have typically small babies who are at high risk, more than 50% of developing childhood schizophrenia. The identical lesion on uh, the maternal chromosome results in uh, Engelmann syndrome here, and you have uh, overexpression of the paternal genes. Here you have higher birth weight babies, and they are at high risk, over 50% of developing autism. I mean, that, that's quite astounding uh, and totally surprising. But it does suggest that neuropsychiatric diseases may have this genomic conflict. So in summary, what is the disease? Uh, in their largest way, they are diseases due to extrinsic causes, diseases due to defense systems, mismatched disease, age-related diseases, genetic and chromosomal diseases, and diseases due to genomic conflict. And so uh, instead of learning 12,000 diseases, you can learn six categories, and you can then graft on those diseases into their categories. So the advantages of this view of medicine. As a former teacher of medical students, I think it would really be wonderful to use this as a platform to teach medicine. Uh, currently, right now, uh, we use mechanism-based explanations, but there are at least as many mechanisms as there are genes. So there are at least 20,000 mechanisms, if not more, because you have interactions going on. Uh, and it's also the basis for therapeutics. Small drugs act on specific molecular targets. So it, it, it's important to teach it, but I don't think out of the gate it's important to teach it. And evolutionary medicine can provide a unifying framework and allow for teaching and learning in a much more effective way. And a brilliant example of this is an anatomist from the University of Chicago, uh, Neil Shubin, who teaches, as I say, anatomy. He wrote a book called Your Inner Fish. And it would have been so wonderful to have learned human anatomy by looking at the evolution of human structures. And I think the same thing could apply to physiology, biochemistry, and to many uh, of the other basic processes we're taught in medical school. Another is that uh, genomics and um, evolutionary medicine, they've already become part of infectious disease uh, prevention and control, genetics, and cancer care. Actually, cancer is a completely somatic evolutionary process. It's not operating over generations between individuals, but within a given individual's over generations of cells. And uh, understanding the genome of cells is critical to understanding uh, cancer and treating it. Uh, using an evolutionary medicine perspective will allow us to take in uh, genomic information as it comes into medicine and more easily integrated, I believe, into uh, treatment and prevention programs, including public health prevention activities. So it's something I think all of us should be more aware of. And lastly, uh, in the research areas, uh, understanding more about these mismatched diseases, which genes are responding to the environment, how does the epigenome regulate this? Will become critical, I think, to dealing with mismatched diseases, going beyond uh, our five simple behaviors. Um, Age-related diseases, I, we've never really understood aging in this way of maybe we should be identifying those genes which display antagonistic pleiotropy. Uh, and maybe there are ways we can modify that, either through environmental choices or perhaps even through drugs. And lastly, uh, I think at least I need to understand much more about genomic conflict, how it occurs, and how important it is to medicine, and in particular, how important it might be to psychiatry. So with that, uh, that was uh, what I wanted to present to you today, and thank you very much for listening.
Bob, thank you so much. That was terrific. All of it from the beginning to the end was learning for me. I didn't know any of this, so thank you. No wonder you were the receiver of both the Perrin Award and the Canadian Gardener Award. Thanks. Now, if you have time after more interesting questions, can you please reflect on what all of this may imply for our gold standard randomized clinical trials for developing preventive and treatment interventions? Right. Well, I think there are at least three levels of understanding disease and what to do about it. I think at the largest level is this evolutionary perspective. At a finer level is uh, the mechanism. And then at a, its most actionable level is ev uh, evidence-based medicine. Uh, so it plays a role, but I think it's not, evidence-based medicine doesn't uh, operate at our highest levels of thinking about health and disease. It really is a way we convert knowledge into action. And I think for most important choices that we make in medicine and public health, they should be based on evidence and a randomized clinical trial is the way to go. So that's how I would kind of embed them almost like Russian dolls with the biggest one being evolutionary medicine, then mechanism-based medicine, and then evidence-based medicine. Thanks. That was a really great talk, and I learned a lot, especially the genome printing stuff was totally new. I can't wait to learn more about that. So I, I really, as a non-clinician, I really appreciated moving from thousands of diseases to six types. <laughs> That's helpful for understanding. And uh, so I was wondering if you have a similar classification suggestion or what you're thinking about, if intervention methods can be grouped in a similar way, if it's one-to-one, -one, or how many types of interventions are there? I haven't actually given any thought to that, but it wouldn't surprise me if we could group interventions by categories of causation at a higher level than mechanism yeah. or a higher level than, you know, a randomized controlled study done for whatever reason it was done. Uh, so it would be interesting to take a critical look and see using these categories of disease classification causation and uh, see if there are more generic types of intervention uh, that can be useful. Just, you know, those five healthy behaviors, uh, you know, keep active, don't smoke, don't drink, uh, keep a healthy body weight and uh, eat healthy food. Uh, that I think is dealing with these mismatched diseases. Uh, but there are probably other better examples which can uh, be thought of in that way. But I think that might be a, a good next step. How do we take this from disease classification perspective into something that says uh, something useful about interventions. Thanks. Hi, I'm Rachel Kotcher. That was an amazing talk. I agree. I, every, I learned so much. I, I could listen to you for like in the, all day. But there were two things that I was thinking when I, and I can't, and I will, and I will be joining you. Um, but you talked about concepts that were new to me, but, and I kept going back to uh, two ideas of time and money. Like, how, like Engelman syndrome, like how long did it take them to figure that out? So when we're thinking forward about using this to, to address public health issues, how long is that gonna take us? And I know that's very broad. And then, and then money, like what is the cost for a lot of this? Because that's all, ultimately what drives a lot of what we end up doing. Right. I actually don't know the storyline, how long it took for Engelman and uh, Prouder Willie to be thought of in this way. But I would have to say, once you have an idea, it's quicker to go back and apply it to other problems. And I think if there are genetic diseases which are due to disease genes on one chromosome versus another, maybe we should look at it as a genomic conflict, maternal-paternal chromosome interaction that's going on. And prader willi is the, the one I chose because it's a classic example in this field. Uh, but I, I would think there are others. Um, how much does it cost? You know, whether we like it or not, in 10 years from now, we're gonna come in and see a patient to understand how their mind is reacting to a disease, what kind of environment they have with our knowledge of their genome. 
genome sequencing now is somewhere between a hundred and thousand dollars. It's cheaper than an MRI. Everybody's going to have it. It's going to be part of the baby record and you carry it for the rest of your life. I mean, you do really now, but uh, you'll carry it for the rest of your life. So uh, I don't think it's going to be expensive uh, to have genomics become part of medicine. Uh, I think the major change is really us who are practicing medicine, public health, to have the skill to do it wisely. And uh, uh, so, yeah, it's part of the reason I wanted to give the talk to you is because I think the time is now for all of us to become more aware of the transformation that's happening in medicine uh, because of genomics. And thank you for your compliment. <laughs> Appreciate it. Okay, it looks like that's enough and uh, we'll see you at one. <laughs>